Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our next session, OGSM Surgical Tutorial 1. I'm Dr. Ng here from UCAM Medical Center, your moderator today for this session. Uh, to be start with, the precise impact of fibroids, which are the most common benign gynecological tumors in women, on reproductive function and infertility is still poorly understood. The need to treat submucosal fibroids is widely accepted. But fibroids in other locations and sizes continue to present a critical conundrum. It's my great honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sabalaja Supermanian, who is no stranger to most of us. He is a sifu to many, especially with regards to minimal invasive surgery or gynae endoscopy. Dr. Selma is currently a consultant, obstetrician and gynecologist and a subspecialist in reproductive medicine and Makota Medical Center in Malacca, Malaysia. He also heads the ONG unit and IVF center at this hospital. He is a past president of the Obstetric and Gynecology Society of Malaysia and currently chairs the endoscopic subcommittee and is involved in promoting gynecological endoscopy surgery in Malaysia. He is a past president of the Asia Pacific Association of Gynecology Endoscopy at Page. He is also the board members of ABZ, Asia Pacific Gynecological Endoscopy Group. Dr. Selva also runs a fellowship in minimal invasive surgery and infertility at Melaka Makota Medical Center and is of the first its kind in the private hospital in Malaysia. So far, he has trained eight gynecologists. He recently published his first book entitled Laparoscopic Surgery in Gynecology and Common Diseases in Women, a book to educate the public and doctors on the benefits of laparoscopic surgery in women. Without further ado, please help to join me to welcome Dr. Selva to share with us his title Intramural Fibroids and Fertility to Operate or Not. Please welcome Dr. Selva. Thank you, Dr. Ng, and uh, thank you, OGSM, for inviting me to speak on this topic of uh, intramural fibroid. Now, uterine fibroid is the commonest monoclonal tumor in women. Fibroids may be the sole cause of infertility in 2 to 3 percent of women. Current literature calls for removal of submucous fibroids and possibly cavity distorting intramural fibroids to optimize pregnancy outcome. However, removal of non-cavity distorting, uh, I call it NCD intramural fibroid is still controversial. So as you can see, this patient has got an intramural fibroid measuring about three by two centimeters and 3D, 3D um, ultrasound shows that it is not involving the cavity, it doesn't involve the cavity. Now, should this be fibroids be removed? Traditionally, we are told that it is not necessary to remove these intramural fibroids. So today I'm going to discuss on whether to operate or not on this kind of non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids. So this is my lecture outline. Now, all my all what I'm going to say has already been published in this review paper, which I wrote recently. It's called, also called Intramural Fibroid and Fertility to Operate or Not. It is available uh, in open access, and if you can type this in, you can get the paper and read all about it. I'm going to summarize what I've written here in this uh, lecture. So the firstly, I will talk about classifications of uh, fibroids. Second is, what is the pathophysiology that causes subfertility in patients with intramural uh, non-cavity distorting fibroids? Does intramural fibroids cause infertility? Does myomectomy improve pregnancy rates? And lastly, are there alternatives to myomectomy for this patient? So this will be my outline. So the first question is, what, what is the classification of fibroids? Now, traditional classification tells us about submucous fibroid, subserosal fibroid, intramural fibroid, and cervical fibroid. This is what, how we call fibroids. But as you know, FIGO has got its own classification. These are the different types of fibroids by FIGO classification. Type 0 and type 1, 0 and type 1 are classical submucous fibroids. Type 2, even though 50% is within the intramural cavity, is still considered as submucosal fibroid. Type 5, 6, and 7 are subserosal fibroids. 
Now, the fibroids that I am interested in and I'm going to talk about are these two types of fibroids, which are type 3 and type 4. Now, you must understand that the thickness of an, a myometrium ranges from about 1.5 centimeters to only 3 centimeters. So, if a fibroid is, say, 3.5 or 4 centimeters, it's either going to bulge out or bulge inside. So, it will be something here, 2 to 3, 2 to 5, type 2 to 5. This is another classification. So, uh, this, these are the type of fibroids, not this one, but these fibroids should be removed for patients who are subfertile. That is my discussion. Uh, I will show you this uh, uh, photograph that I took this morning. It is a patient with subserous fibroid, some, something like this. And this patient is pregnant with a 12 week of pregnancy after IVF. So we know that subserous fibroids do not affect fertility and patients can get pregnant even with IVF. Now let's look at pathophysiology. Now pathophysiology for uh, uh, intramural fibroids is very confusing and it is written this, I'm going to quote this particular paper which is potential causes of subfertility in patients with intramural fibroid and this is the diagram that I'll be uh, pointing out and to explain why intramural fibroid even if it is slow, it is, if it is small, can cause uh, a decrease in fertility. Now these are the uh, 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 the causes of uh, why intramural fibroid causes uh, infertility in patients with intramural fibroids. The first is implantation problem, second is a problem with the junctional zone, thirdly is uterine myometrial peristalsis, fourthly is fibroid pseudocapsule and fifthly is steroid hormones. Let me go through this one by one. Let's look at implantation. Now we know that implantation is a very complex process. This is one of the difficulties in for all, all IVF patients, we may create very good embryos, but we don't know whether the embryos are going to implant. And there are many factors that are involved. And the factors that are involved are Hoxa-10, glycodilin, leuco leukemia in vitri factor, glutathione peroxidase. These are some of the factors that affect. And it is known that Hoxa-10 is responsible for cellular differentiation, while glycodilin is responsible for promoting angiogenesis suppressing natural killer cells and inhibiting and binding of spermatozoa to the zona pellucida. So in the presence of, in, in, in normally both factors are reduced during follicular phase and increased during implantation. In patients with intramural fibroid, we know that both Hoxa-10 and glycodilin are reduced during implantation. So this may be one of the factors that affect uh, fertility in patients with intramural fibroid. Next, let's look at the junctional zone. Now, the junctional zone, as you know, is only seen by, is usually seen by MRI. This is the endometrial cavity with the endometrium, and this is the junctional zone, and this is the myometrium. Now, uterine peristalsis originates in the junctional zone. Disruption of this junctional zone by fibrosis may lead to increased peristalsis, and thickening of the junctional zone caused by intramural fibroids leads to poor reproductive outcome. So, NKC, there's a, uh, 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 we have reduced and macrophages increase in the endometrium closer to the fibroid compared to other areas. So if you have a fibroid, all these factors, especially if the fibroid touches the junctional zone, then it is going to affect uterine peristalsis and it's going to affect fertility. So because of this reason, we have, uh, uh, we have postulated, uh, we have actually suggested that type 4 fibroids should be further subdivided into type 4A and 4B. The 4A involves the junctional zone and 4B does not involve the junctional zones. So our presumption is that 4A will probably affect fertility much more than 4B. So what about myometrial peristalsis? <clears throat> there are two types of uterine contractions. The first contraction is a focal and sporadic or bulging of the myometrium. This is not an important, this doesn't affect fertility. Whereas the, the type of uh, rhythmic and subtle stripping movement in the sub-endometrial myometrium, which is known as uterine peristalsis, this affects fertility. And uterine peristalsis is captured by CINI MRI. And this is a very complex process where uh, repeated re uh, MRI is done and then the movement of the sub-endometrium is then measured and that is called uterine peristalsis. Now, what do we know about uh, uterine peristalsis? From menstruation 
to the mid ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle, the uterus contracts from the cervix to the fundus and increasing it with increasing frequency. So this will promote the passage of spermatozoa from the cervix up to the fundus of the uterus and into the fallopian tube. Whereas in post ovulation, the contraction frequency decreases to relatively quiet during implantation. So during implantation, we do not want any uterine peristalsis so that, uh, so that uh, pregnancy will occur. And in the luteal phase, the direction of the peristalsis is reversed, that is from the fundus to the cervix. So what happens is that uterine peristalsis is increased in patients with intramural and submucous fibroids during the mid luteal phase and decreased during the periovulatory phase. And this was shown very elegantly in this study entitled Decreased Pregnancy Rate is Linked to Abnormal Uterine Peristalsis Caused by Intramural Fibroid by Yoshino. Now, in this elegant study, what he did, what uh, this group did is that they took 95 infertile patients with uterine fibroids and then they did CINE um, MRI to see whether these patients have, uh, uh, have uh, increase in uh, uterine peristalsis. So out of these 95 patients, they got 51 patients which fulfill all the criteria and they found that 29 patients, which is 57 patients, were assigned as low frequency. That means the, there was zero to one peristalsis per three minutes. Whereas 22 patients, out, that is 43%, had high frequency, which is more than two times of uterine peristalsis in three minutes. And they found that out of the 29 patients who had low frequency, 10 got pregnant. And they got pregnant with normal uh, procedures. What they did is they just underwent infertility treatment for four months up to IUI, not IVF. And they had 10 patients who got pregnant. But none of the patients who had high frequency, that is the 23, 22 patients, uh, did not have any pregnancies at all. So con they concluded that high frequency of uterine peristalsis during the mid luteal phase might be one of the causes of infertility associated with intramural type of fibroids. So let's next look at fibroid pseudocapsule. Uh, we all know that there is a capsule surrounding any fibroid and this capsule we call it a pseudocapsule. Now this pseudocapsule contains smooth muscles and neurotransmitters. It is highly vascular and it's upregulated by endogolin and CD34. And the PC thickness, the pseudocapsule thickness varies with the type and location of fibroid. It is thicker in the submucous fibroid compared to the intramural compared to subserous fibroids. So subserous fibroids have got a thinnest uh, pseudocapsule. The cervical fibroid actually has got the thickest and also the submucous fibroids are thick. So the presence of this pseudocapsule with its cytokines, growth factors and hormones may be responsible for the abnormal uterine peristalsis, which may cause, uh, you, uh, may cause premature deliveries in women with intramural fibroids. This neurotransmitters in the, in the pseudocapsule is important in promoting inflammation and proper wound healing. Now, so it's important to do intracapsular myomectomy without excising this uh, pseudocapsule to reduce intraoperative blood loss and enhance better uterine healing and correct musculature and anatomical restoration to preserve uterine functionality of the reproductive purpose. So when we are doing myomectomy, we must try to do the surgery within this uh, pseudocapsule and this pseudocapsule help to heal after the surgery. However, this pseudocapsule has got a place to play in infertility in patients with intramural fibroid. Next, let's look at steroid hormones. Now, we know that fibroid tissue have got a higher concentration of, uh, of aromatase, estradiol, estrogen receptors, alpha and beta, and progesterone receptors compared to the surrounding healthy myometrium. Fibroid, is, as we know, is an estrogen-dependent tumor. However, studies by this Japanese group, uh, uh, Ishikawa et al., have shown that both estrogen and progesterone are responsible for fibroid growth and maintenance. In an elegant study, they actually what they did is they took uh, uterine fibroid tissue and implanted in, into immunodeficient uh, rats and then instilled the rats with estrogen, progesterone, and then estrogen and progesterone. And they found that only when estrogen and progesterone is infiltrated, the fibroid grows. So you need both estrogen and progesterone for fibroid growth. 
So high estrogen level stimulates the junctional zone and induces rapid uterine contraction and progesterone antagonizes its effect and suppresses uterine contractility. We know that we all give progesterone uh, as a luteal phase support and this is one of the ways in which it helps, it suppresses uterine contractility. So steroid hormones also plays a role in how uh, intramural fibroids affect fertility. So the next question I would like to ask is, does intramural non-cavity distorting fibroids causes infertility? Now, the literature is divided. Firstly, these are all the papers that comes up and say that intramural fibroid actually reduces fertility outcome, however small it is. Anything more than two centimeters, it is said to affect fertility outcome. Similarly, there are also enough studies to say that fertility outcome between study groups and control group is similar in patients with intramural non-cavity distorting fibroid. So the, the literature is divided. So in that in situations like this, we look for review articles. Or <clears throat> so this is a review article that came out in 2009. In this article, Sunkara et al. looked at the effect of intramural fibroids without uterine cavity involvement on the outcome of IVF. It is a meta-analysis. And in, in this meta-analysis, they concluded that the presence of non-cavity distorting fibroid is associated with adverse pregnancy outcome in women undergoing IVF treatment. So in 2018, another uh, meta-analysis came out and this is the impact of non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids on the efficacy of IVF and embryo transfer and an updated meta-analysis. In this meta-analysis, the conclusion was that also, the present evidence suggests that non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids would significantly reduce implantation rate, clinical pregnancy rate, live birth rate, and significantly increase miscarriage rate after IVF treatment, but it would not significantly increase ectopic pregnancy rate. So, current evidence tells us that non-cavity distorting fibroids actually reduces, uh, it actually causes infertility and reduces IVF success rate. So the next question is, does myomectomy improve pregnancy rates? Doesn't mean that there is a fibroid. If you remove, will it improve pregnancy rates? And this is an important question. Again, the literature is divided. There are several studies that say that yes, myomectomy will improve pregnancy rates. Yet there are other studies that says that myomectomy is not advisable. So it is important, this, this is another, this is a study, a follow-up study of this uh, uh, Yoshino, whom I described earlier. He looked at myomectomy, he, he looked at this study in which, he, uh, uh, this study entitled, Myomectomy Decreases Abnormal Uterine Peristalsis and Increases Pregnancy Rate. So in this study, what he did is, of all the patients that had increased uterine peristalsis, 15 of them, what he did is, he did myomectomy on them. And in, in and, and in, in all of them, 14 of them, the peristalsis actually normalized. And following my, my, myomectomy and second MRI, six of the 15 patients actually achieved a pregnancy. So he concluded that the presence of uterine fibroid might induce abnormal uterine peristalsis, leading to infertility, and myomectomy may improve fertility in these patients. So what uh, do we know so far? What we know is that intramural fibroids actually decreases pregnancy rates. When intramural fibroid causes increased uterine peristalsis, pregnancy rates decreases. So one of the mechanism in which intramural fibroids decreases pregnancy rates is uterine peristalsis. Probably this is an important part. And, but we are unsure whether myomectomy in these patients improve pregnancy rates. If there is an increased uterine peristalsis in these patients with intramural fibroids, the chances that myomectomy may improve pregnancy rates. So patients who have intramural fibroids, and if they have an increased uterine peristalsis, then myomectomy may improve pregnancy rates. But the problem is that measuring uterine peristalsis using CD MRI is difficult and expensive. And this is where we have a problem. We, we cannot measure uterine peristalsis uh, by other methods. So now we come to the question of, can we do other things beside myomectomy to try and shrink this fibroid so that we can improve pregnancy rates? So these are the five methods in which I have explored. The first is Esmaya, Ulipristal Acetate. Second is GnRH Analogs. Third is Etosiban. 
Fourth is uterine artery embolization. And the last is high intensity focused ultrasound. So let me go through this one by one. Now we all know what uripristal acetate is. It is a selective progesterone receptor modulator. Its advantage over myomectomy is that the patient can conceive immediately after treatment. So there are case reports on type 2 and type 3 fibroids. And what they have done is the patients with type 2 and type 3 fibroids, they have treated the patient with esmaya in the hope that the fibroid shrinks in size and move away from the endometrial cavity. And when it moves away from the endometrial cavity, the patient conceive. So, but the only problem is we have this worry of liver failure. So I don't know whether any one of you would dare to give patients who have got a two or three centimeter intramural fibro, which is non-cavity distorting asthma here to shrink it and then uh, allow the patient to conceive. But this is something to think about. Next is gonadotropin releasing hormone GnRH analog. We all know what GnRH agonist is. GnRH agonists bind to GnRH receptors causing desensitization and ultimately reducing estrogen and progesterone causing reduction in fibroid growth. Now GnRH also acts on the GnRH receptors expressed by the fibroid to reduce cellular proliferation. During this process, water will diffuse out from the fibroid cells causing shrinkage of the fibroid. So can we give this patient GnRH agonist to shrink the fibroid and then do an embryo transfer or uh, encourage the patient to con conceive? But there is lack of study to determine the effect of GnRH on fertility. We postulate that the significant reduction of fibroid volume by GnRH may reduce the impact of cavity encroaching fibroid and subsequently improve implantation. And in this study, Castle, out of three out of his in five infertile patients with fibroids successfully conceived, two of them conceived without surgical intervention. So you could consider this. You could consider actually patients with intramural fibroids to give them GnRH to shrink the fibroids and then uh, allowing the patient to conceive or even doing embryo transfer. So this is another option instead of doing myomectomy. Now, what about etosiban? Now, etosiban is actually a combined oxytocin and vasopressin receptor antagonist. As an oxytocin receptor antagonist, etosiban competes with oxytocin at the oxytocin receptor in the endometrial cells and decrease endometrial contraction and prevent embryo expulsion during the implantation phase. By reducing the oxytocin effect, it inhibits oxytocin-induced prostaglandin production and increase endometrial blood supply. So as vasopressin antagonist, etosiban relaxes the uterine arteries and decreases systolic blood pressure to improve blood perfusion to the endometrium and myometrium. So all this sounds very good for, for an infertility patient. The antagonistic effect of oxytocin and vasopressin receptors improve uterine receptivity and embryo implantation. But however, all the studies done for patients are for repeated implantation failure. So people, etosiban has been advocated for repeated implantation failures. There's no studies that have looked at etosiban for uterine fibroids, intramural uterine fibroids to improve pregnancy. So this is something that we could look at, whether this could be an alternative to myomectomy in patients, especially if they have increased uterine peristalsis. Now, what about uterine artery embolization? Now, we know what is uterine artery embolization. It is embol embol embolization with uh, uh, small particles placed into the uterine artery. Now, uterine artery embolization is believed to affect embryo implantation and difficulty in maintaining gestation leading to increased miscarriage. The risk of amenorrhea and ovarian failure after UAE in young women is low. However, there is a worry that poor oocyte quality and poor response to ovarian stimulation in patients who have undergone UAE. Several studies of intrauterine adhesions, endometrial atrophy and fistula between the uterine cavity and the embolized myoma post UAE has been described in the literature. In one study, more than one third of patients were found to have intracavity tissue necrosis three to nine months post UAE. All these are bad, bad things for pregnancy and uh, uh, for, for, for pregnancy and embryo transfer. American College of ONG, Society of Interventional Radiology, and RCOG have placed UAV as a relative contraindication for women desiring future pregnancy, future fertility. Although, they have, although UAE probably can be used for large submucous type 2 fibroids to assist in pregnancy, but I think nobody in the correct mind will subject a patient with a non-cavity distorting uterine fibroid, say 2 or 3 centimeters, to undergo UAE 
so that it will shrink and then achieve pregnancy. So I think UAE is probably out of the picture. Right? I brought it in as for, for, for completion. Now let's look at the latest technique, which is called high intensity focused ultrasound surgery. Now HIFU is an organ sparing, non-invasive thermal ablative procedure. Now it uses an extracorporeal transducer to focus a big intensity ultrasound beam to the targeted myoma to thermally, thermally ablate the tumors without introducing needles or probes into the tumor. Now, there are two types of uh, HIFU, which is the MR HIFU and also the ultrasound uh, guided HIFU. And there is minimal damage to the surrounding normal myometrium with obvious damage to the, and with, without obvious damage to elastic and collagen fibers in the normal uterine muscle, resulting in less scar tissue formation and less risk of collagen fiber hyperplasia. So when we are, when we are doing HIFU, what happens is that the fibroid is ablated within the capsule and so there is no damage to any of the areas outside the capsule. Uh, th so thus this looks like a very interesting uh, concept. So theoretically this will reduce the pregnancy risk in women who are undergoing uh, high food treatment for uterine fibroids as compared to myomectomy. As we know myomectomy will cut through the layers, take out the fibroid and then suture the, the myometrium. Whereas HIFU, a beam is just used to ablate the small fibroids, thus shrinking it. So clinical studies also confirm that HIFU avoids ovarian function impairment and adverse reaction, thus preserving ability to conceive. So they have done studies to show that the AMH after HIFU treatment is uh, similar uh, to the AMH before HIFU treatment. So it doesn't affect the ovarian function. So studies have also shown that pregnancy rate post HIFU is 95.4%, which is slightly higher than post myomectomy, which is 64 to 68.6%. 6, and also the spontaneous abortion rates for HIFU is 14.9%, which is similar to that of uh, myomectomy, which is 13 to 24%. And this is slight, significantly lower than the pregnancy with untreated fibroid. So this may, HIFU may be something that we can think of to shrink fibroid in uh, in small non cavity distorting fibroid. So this will be my conclusions. Firstly, there is enough evidence that non cavity distorting intramural fibroids affect fertility. I know we are, all of us fertility specialists actually tell the patients, don't worry, this will not affect your fertility. But in in in, in reality, there is a slight decrease in fertility in patients with intramural fibroid. Type 3 fibroid have a higher risk of poor pregnancy outcome compared to type 4 fibroids. As I told earlier, type 3 fibroids are the fibroids that touches the endometrial cavity but does not bulge into the endometrial cavity, whereas type 4 type fibroids do not. So these fibroids have a poorer pregnancy outcome. There are many possible causes why intramural fibroids affect fertility. As I've discussed, discussed in the fact pathophysiology, you can affect implantation, junctional zone, pseudocapsule, but the only measurable cause appears to be increased uterine peristalsis. Unfortunately, not all patients with intramural fibroids have increased uterine peristalsis. And the problem is that currently there's no good and inexpensive method of measuring uterine peristalsis. And CINE MRI seems to be accurate method, but it is expensive. Can you imagine patient, uh, putting a patient, all our patients on CINE MRI to look for the uterine peristalsis and we only deal with the patients who have intramural fibroid with uterine peristalsis, whereas those who don't have, we tell them to conceive on their own. There is other methods, transvaginal ultrasound is a method, it's cheaper, but the modality, but it's still very user dependent and it's still not clearly defined how to measure uterine peristalsis using a transvaginal ultrasound. So we need a better method need to be devised to measure uterine peristalsis easily and effectively. With vitrification, pregnancy rate after frozen embryo transfer is improving. Now, uh, even in my practice, I find more and more patients conceiving after frozen embryo transfer than fresh embryo transfer. So, Myomectomy, my, my conclusion is that myomectomy should not be the first line treatment of patients with small intramural fibroids. But what we should do is in patients with many frozen embryo, the strategy could be to consider surgical 
or non-surgical intervention only in patients who have failed embryo transfer. Myomectomy may appear to be a big procedure to perform in patients with small intramural fibers. Can you imagine doing uh, surgery on patients with three to two to three centimeter fibroids uh, just to help them to conceive? This appears to be a big procedure. So of all the non-surgical methods that I've described above, HIFU appears to be a most attractive option to shrink these small intramural fibroids because it is non-invasive technique and has very few side effects. So, however, this needs to be explored in clinical studies. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Er. Thank you, Dr. Salva, for his very informative and comprehensive lectures. We have a few questions from the audience here. We will go for our Q&A. For the audience, you can continue to type your questions in the Q&A sessions. We will try to entertain your questions. Uh, first question from this audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salva, for sharing the meta-analysis results with regards to non-KVT distorting intramural fibroids. What is the minimum size or mean size that you will go for or you will encourage or you will offer myomectomy? Is there any minimum size? Okay, the, I didn't talk about because I didn't have the time to talk about size. Um, my time else, the, most of the studies have shown, some of the studies have shown that the size, the cutoff size is 2 centimeters. Two, and some people say 2.75 centimeters. So um, I am not advocating surgery for fibroids of two, two centimeter uh, 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 size fibroid. However, if it is type three, you, you might want to consider that. So as I said in my conclusion, we will uh, help patients to conceive either by natural method or by IVF even in a patient with type 3, 2 centimeter fibroid. But if the patient is not conceiving or the patient is failing implantation with this fibroid, then we need to look at some way in shrinking the fibroids. You may want to try Ulipristal, GNRH, or perform myomectomy. But I think alternative methods will probably be better than performing myomectomy in this kind of fibroids. Thank you, Dr. Uh, with regards to the use of GNRH analog to shrink the fibroid before any fertility treatments, uh, normally you go for how many doses? And is there any target size that you aim for? For example, from 8 cm, you will try to shrink to 2 cm or 3 cm. How many doses yeah. that you will go for and what is your target? Okay, there is no studies that have looked at GNRH for fibroids and fertility. Let me, let me clear it. I am just postulating that this is something that we can look at. So what, what I'm trying to say is that if the patient has a fibroid, an intramural fibroid, and if the patient is not getting pregnant, then you have an option of using GNRH to shrink the fibroid. But I think this is an interesting option and people should do studies to see whether this will actually improve pregnancy rate. But there's not been any study. GNRH analog for fibroid has been done for symptomatic fibroids, but not for fertility. Thank you, Dr. Sapa. So interestingly, we hear about this uterine peristalsis today. So this, uh, but, uh, this audience is asking about, is there any medical treatment to reduce this peristalsis during the mid uterine phase? Also wondering, is there any medical options? Yeah, as I said, the only one that is available is atosiban. Atosiban is actually it does actually reduce uterine peristalsis and that is the one that people that has been advocated for patients with repeated uh, uh, repeated implantation failure. I have never used it actually, I've never used cetosiban, but if we know whether the patient has uterine peristalsis, it is good, it is, it is interesting to try it. Again, this is an area of research, it has never been done and I think it is something interesting that we can look at. But the only problem is we need to actually check whether the patient has got uterine peristalsis or not. And that is where the, the bottleneck is. If we can have a system whereby we could do we could measure uterine peristalsis, then we can do a study to see whether etosiban will reduce the uterine, uterine peristalsis and patient will conceive. Okay. So uh, coming to this question, when we perform myomectomy, uh, for fibroids before any fertility treatment, do we really causing more harm by performing the surgery uh, rather than not performing it? What is your view about that? That is a difficult question. Yes, yes, that is everybody's everybody's point, isn't it? Mm. 
if you have a fibroid, if a patient has a fibroid, a small fibroid, the patient is not conceiving and the patient does not have any other factor causing her infertility, what are we going to do? That is the whole idea. So what I have shown in this uh, paper is that the presence of the fibroid actually reduces fertility. And we are not sure whether myomectomy will improve the outcome. So what I'm trying to say is we need to look at alternative methods to try and shrink this fibroid and help the patient to conceive, whether that it be Ulipristal, GnRH or HIFU. That, that is the whole idea of this. I'm trying to open up people's mind to say that you don't actually have to go and do a myomectomy for patients with small fibroids, but you have to remember that that may be the cause of the patient not getting pregnant, probably due to uterine peristalsis. Okay. Is there any common problem or issue that you will face when you offer patient high food treatments from your experience? The um, problem or issue? Now, HIFU is a very, it's actually not that new, it's, it's, a, it's quite an old treatment, but it is coming back because of the ultrasound based HIFU. Mm -hmm. Now, complications with HIFU, I've already discussed in other webinars. Mm -hmm. The biggest complication that we worry about is bowel perforation, but its risk of bowel perforation is far, far lower than that of even a laparoscopic myomectomy or an open myomectomy. Its risk is in the region of 0.01%. So if you select your patient properly and the bowel is not in the line of the beam of, uh, of the ultrasound uh, beam, then the chances are very low. Of course, there are other complications, minor complications like immaturia, skin rashes or skin burns. All this can be accounted for. They are very minor complications. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dr. Salva. Uh, do you routinely use adhesion barriers after your myomectomy, especially laparoscopically? For example, I am I am very fussy. I've actually done a, a, a paper on this. The the additions that are the most that occur postoperatively is actually myomectomy. Myomectomy has got eighty percent addition rate, and I am I always hundred percent all patients that I do laparoscopic myomectomy I will use anti additions. And my the the two different anti additions that I use are. Uh, Hilo barrier gel and also intercept. These are the two that I use. Mm. Okay, uh, probably for one more question about uh, use of vasoplastin in laparoscopic myomectomy. Uh, do you routinely use it? Uh, what is the volume that you use and how you inject the solution? Is it a single puncture site or multiple puncture site? Okay, um, you're digressing, but okay, I will answer this question. <laughs> uh, uh, vasoplastin. I use it. I use it routinely for vasopressin for laparoscopic myomectomy. I dilute one ampule in 200 ml of uh, saline, and I usually my technique of injecting is just I go for one point between the fibroid and the uterus, just one injection, and all the all the vasopressin goes into that puncture. Now there are many people inject it in different different places, but what happens if it comes out? So if you go at one point of entry, once you have injected until the whole uterus become white, you can remove it. In fact, very interestingly, mm. uh, there, there are some patients whom fibroids are contraindicated. I mean, vasopressin is contraindicated. Maybe arrhythmias or the patient or the anesthetist is unhappy. In fact, I'm, I'm actually putting up a video presentation tomorrow mm. of how to use a Foley's catheter as a tonique for patients who are undergoing laparoscopic myomectomy. So this is another way so of looking at blood loss. Yes, agree with you, to the Selva. So there's one more question about some mucosa fibroid, those type one or type two size, maybe five to six cm. Uh, besides hysteroscopy, is laparoscopic approach and feasible options? What is your view about okay. that? Yes, uh, I do. I do. Mm. I do laparoscopic uh, myomectomy for submucous fibroid, especially type two fibroids. If you have the fibroid that is large and more than 50% is in the myometrium, it is almost impossible to remove them by trans cervical resection. Uh, you might have to do twice. Now, uh, there are two options. I give the patients two options. One is to shrink the submucosal fibroid with GnRH and lock for three to six months. And once the fibroid reaches about two 
2.5 to 3 centimeters. That is my tolerance level for doing transvaginal trans cervical resection. And the idea, the way to do it is actually to go into the um, edges of the fibroid using a probe. You push so that you get into the capsule and try to enucleate the fibroid and then do the resection. Don't straight away resect. You straight away resect, you'll be digging into the cervicals of fibroid. But if the, the other option I'll tell them is to do laparoscopic myomectomy. You just cut into the cavity and take out the fibroid. We can take out a big submucosal fibroid easily. And then you need to be very meticulous in repairing the, repairing the uterus, the just like what you repair a, a, a fibroid. You, you do it in three layers, three layers. endometrial cavity, and then the myometrium, and then the serosal layer. Then you're, you're fine. Okay, maybe we go for last question from this uh, audience. Should we still use uripister acetate, considering NICE guideline has advised against using it in its latest guidelines with regards to liver toxicity? Yes, yes, I, I, I would be, I would be very scared to use. But there are still papers coming out. In fact, recently there are some papers that have come out using uripister acetate for patients like this. Of course, if you tell the patient. There is a rare complication of liver failure. Nobody wants mm. to take it, especially yeah. for patients with small fibroids. So I brought it up because mm. it is a thought process. Yeah. Um, so it is a thought process that mm. shrinking the fibroid may give a better fertility outcome. And there are some studies that have showed it as well. So this is just a thought process that uh, so that for completion. Okay. I think uh, there's no more question for audience. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Salva for his very uh, enlightening talk, informative talk. We always enjoy uh, your lecture, Dr. Salva. I will see you for most of us. Uh, I think that's all. I conclude these sessions. Doctor, again, Dr. Salva, you want to say something to the audience? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this particular topic. Uh, I actually took on this topic because I, somebody in Singapore asked me to give this lecture last year and, and, and it became so interesting that I decided to write a review paper on this. So you can go and read the review paper. Uh, many more information is available in that review paper and it's an open access paper. You can get it from the internet. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Sama. Thank you again, everyone, for your great jobs. Thank you.